I just mentioned that Jesse Liu of Rabbit is coming. And, uh, you know, I just, I'm wondering, again, you've invested in consumer AI. Where is, where does Lightspeed sort of fall on, on, on um, like hardware, AI driven hardware and wearables and, and wearable assistance? Totally. I mean, I think, you know, at large, as we look at the venture industry, uh, I would very much say that AI has brought investing in hardware um, and hardware adjacent businesses very much back in style. Um, you know, we've seen examples like Rabbit, which I'm excited to get into later today. Um, you know, companies like Rewind with their, you know, Pendant, Tab, Humane, et cetera. Um, I think really, you know, the, the key for a lot of these businesses is, uh, you know, fundamentally the personal assistant that they're building around the core hardware, right? And the utility that they're delivering to the end consumer. And so, you know, you think in Rabbit's case, a lot of the sort of core innovation is around the large action model that they've built, which uh, you know effectively will execute specific actions on behalf of the end end user, and I think that's sort of you know more broadly representative of you know one of the one of the benefits that AI provides to consumers and something that we're really excited about around lowering the barrier to access to previously you know unattainable services like personal assistance. Um, and I think the other interesting thing with you know you know unlocking AI general assistance for consumers is um, it then unlocks sort of net new commercial models, things like you know third-party partnerships that then lead to um, you know affiliate revenues and all that. And you know I think being able to sort of position yourself as the you know de facto interface um, and then build an entire ecosystem around it uh, is you know is, is a great position to be in. And so excited to hear more from Jesse. And have you looked at a company, or have you uh, would you fund one? I mean, I think a lot of people think it's fascinating, um, but, but maybe they think you know an AI app is more interesting. You know, we we've spent time with all the different players in the industry as a team. Um, you know, one of my colleagues here in the audience, Moritz, actually got to know Jesse quite well. Um, I'm excited to get to know him later today as well. Um, we, we have not made an investment in the space. Uh, historically, we've made quite a few investments in, in and around hardware, but uh, we're very much on the lookout. So uh, if anybody here is building, you know, in and around AI and hardware, please come find us. Great. Uh, so one of your AI deals is very hot, Mistral. Uh, just raised another big round. Congratulations. You know, like so many AI companies that are in the news right now, it's a really young company. I mean, a year ago, one of the founders was still at Google. Another one was at the Meta Labs, at Meta AI Lab in Paris. Tell me a little bit about um, how that deal came together and also why you think it has, stands a chance against OpenAI. Absolutely. So, you know, I think Mistral is, you know, one of the best examples of Lightspeed being sort of positioned as a global venture capital firm. Uh, that was very much sort of a cross-sector, cross-geo, cross-stage investment for us as a team. And so, um, you know, our partners on the ground in Europe, Paul Murphy, Antoine Maroud, um, they, they were sort of the ones who initially brokered the relationship, were able to sort of, you know, get us an early look at, at, uh, at the business ahead of the financing. Um, and obviously, it's a space that we've been studying quite a bit in advance. You know, we've made foundation model investments in the past. Um, you know, we've been investing in AI for, you know, 20 plus years now, uh, you know, over 50 investments, over a billion dollars deployed in and around AI in the past decade. Um, with Mistral in particular, you know, I think, uh, you know, there were a bunch of different considerations that went into it. Largely, though, the underwriting was around the team, uh, you know, that Arthur has assembled and uh, just seeing sort of the, uh, you know, the, the caliber and the quality and their understanding around what it takes to build, you know, disruptive foundation models while also having some of the sovereign considerations that come with, uh, you know, building one that's headquartered in the EU. Um, that was a big part of the initial underwrite. And I think, you know, one of the more exciting things has just been seeing their pace of execution since then. Um, you know, certainly I think, you know, being able to push out the quality of a foundation model that they have in, in such short time uh, and be able to do so in such a capital efficient manner, uh, you know, with the most recent, you know, models, you know, costing less than 22 million to, to train. Um, but, uh, you know, I think the, the next sort of thing that we're excited about with, with Mistral and, and uh, you know, one thing that I would, I would you know, stress to the group to, to check out is, um, the, as I think about distribution and getting the product into the hands of consumers, uh, you know, thinking about you know some of these recent commercial partnerships um, with you know the recent Microsoft one being an example that Arthur you know highlighted on on, uh, on Twitter earlier this week. Um, that's just one example of how you know we want to sort of leverage third-party partners and and sort of uh, expand usage across the board and hopefully you know be beneficial to the entire ecosystem. Well, speaking of partners and the and the fact that it's done what it has sort of very economically compared to OpenAI. Uh, NVIDIA is another investor, which is great. NVIDIA is investing in lots of startups. Uh, you have a little bit of a better view than 
of those of us on the outside. What does NVIDIA bring to the table? I mean, does it, does it help the company to access chips that other people can't? What are the advantages there? It's a good question. So I think, yes, there's, there's certainly preferential access uh, and pricing when it comes to you know, access to, to GPUs. Um, I think beyond that, uh, there's you know, at this point a bit of legitimacy that you know, partnering up with one of the, the big cloud players um, you know, we'll, we'll bring to the table as well. And so, you know, even beyond NVIDIA, you know, you've seen a bunch of the hyperscalers getting very active in, you know, investing in early stage businesses. Um, and for them, you know, they're very much as an alignment of incentives in terms of, uh, you know, not only sort of lifting the entire industry, but sort of driving back, you know, wh where is a lot of the capital going to go? It's going to go to spend back to the hyperscalers. And so, um, you know, I do think that there's certainly alignment of business models, but also, um, you know, for startups, it brings a sense of legitimacy. And you mentioned Microsoft too, and I, I, you know, I know the press sort of interpreted its investment as a, a bit of a way of Microsoft pushing back on regulators, which are concerned about its uh, very deep ties to open AI. I just wondered what you think of that, if there's any truth to that. It's a good question. Um, you know, I, I don't actually personally have any perspectives on that point. Uh, you know, I think, again, for, for, from Mr. All's perspective, a, a big push was, you know, how do we sort of get this into the hands of developers globally? And I think, you know, Microsoft, because it has a global presence with Azure, um, you know, being able to leverage a lot of that international connectivity was, was sort of, um, on our side, a big part of the, um, big part of the rationale. Um, and, you know, hopefully one of many commercial partnerships to come. And then um, last for us, you know, I was just, I was at up front summit yesterday and I was listening to Brian Singerman of Founders Fund. Using his remarks, the interviewer said, what is broken about venture? And I put this in the newsletter last night. Um, but he said, um, you know, the thing that's sort of most, most concerning right now is this whole wave. He thinks that all the benefits are really going to accrue to incumbents because I think he said, you know, compared to the kind of lumbering incumbents of yesteryear, these guys are, you know, quote, exceedingly competent. So as an investor making, trying to make investments here, how do you think about that sort of very valid uh, observation? Yeah, it's a great, great observation. I think first I want to highlight the fact that, um, you know, with Upfront Summit, everybody being in L.A., it's just amazing seeing, you know, the entire tech community coming together, and uh, hopefully, you know, this events like this are, you know, an opportunity to to move forward the local tech ecosystem. Um, so appreciate you all being here. Uh, you know, in in regards to the comment around sort of a lot of the value accruing to incumbents versus, uh, you know, versus you know challengers, I think. One of the things that we think a lot about, at least on the consumer side, is where can you build moats? You know, I think obviously any startup that's coming in, you know, there's an advantage that you have inherently around being able to move quickly, ship fast, um, and, and sort of, you know, build a team that can be nimble. But I think beyond that, you know, some of the moats that we think about, at least on the consumer side, are, um, you know, either unique uh, distribution wedges or, um, you know, are, are there basically uh, unique business models that you can be establishing? And I think, you know, an, an example of this is, uh, you know, a few of our portfolio companies, companies like Beehive and Pika, um, with AI innovation, they've sort of been able to establish uh, this sort of new monetization model and, and new monetization approach where you can not only, you know, monetize content consumers, but also content creators. Um, and, and I think you can do so in a way that a lot of the incumbents are maybe not as well positioned to do. Um, and so I think that that's one mode. And then I think that really the last piece is around, um, you know, proprietary access to data that, you know, a lot of consumers maybe may not be comfortable giving to, you know, the, one of the larger incumbents, but, um, you know, a, and a challenger comes in, has uh, u a unique value prop centered around utility, uh, which again, I think in 2024, we're gonna be seeing a lot around with, uh, you know, the shift t more towards, um, you know, utility-based use cases and AI applications. Um, if you can de deliver, uh, you know, 10x better product experience um, and, and sort of, you know, get sort of that, drive that network effect and drive high switching costs early on with the end consumer. Similar modes that we've been underwriting in consumer businesses for 20 plus years now, so. Right, great, yeah. good points. Same old, same old. I mean, you know, the cycle renews itself. Anyway, thank you so much. Really great to talk to you and to meet you for the first time. And thank you, everyone. Um, thank you all. <laughs>